full-on botnet uh, for mobile phones application, um, which was not very hidden at all. It was a generally a botnet application. Um, it once installed, it could send data out, including your phone information, your network information, via a web connection back to a targeted server. It could spam co uh, phone contacts for continued distribution so that it could continue to distribute itself. Um, it's essentially a botnet for, spy for Symbian mobile phones. What makes this one really interesting is the binary is signed as safe by Symbian. Uh, turns out the process at that time, I don't know if it still is, but the process at that time was uh, for them signing and stamping a binary as acceptable and safe uh, was that it passed F-Secure virus check and, and, and maybe was manually inspected. They, had a, um, they would select a certain percentage of the uh, applications for manual inspection. So basically, if you didn't get a real virus or a known virus in there, you could be stamped safe by Symbian's key. And that one was. Uh, so the 09 Droid banking app attack, uh, this one's Android. This guy created, uh, I think, 50 or so banking front ends and got them into the, uh, the Google Android marketplace. Um, from, from my understanding, they didn't actually do anything malicious from the ones that I know people have reversed a bunch of them, and they weren't malicious. Um, I think he was just trying to get 0.99 euros for each download and trying to grab it quick, and he did. He, he had a ton of downloads of these. Um, but it was a perfect opportunity to steal data, exfiltrate data, grab your banking credentials. He just either chose not to use it or we haven't found the ones that he did it in. <clears throat> um, so it was approved and downloadable from the Google Android marketplace. Google didn't even look at it. Got it up there, put it up there, go ahead. So, so it's, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, in general, the app stores are giving a false sense of security to folks. They think, hey, this is stamped by Symbian. Hey, this is uh, at the BlackBerry App Store. Hey, this is on the Google Android Marketplace. It's got to be safe. If I'm downloading from those places, it's, it's got to be safe, right? And it's really not the case. So let's uh, bring up another monkey picture and talk about uh, BlackBerry's security mechanisms. Um, so I want everybody to know RIM takes security very seriously. Here's a list of links that talks about uh, the security mechanisms and how to protect your, your phone. Read them, it's good stuff. The, the BlackBerry security mechanisms of, of all the mobile device operating systems today, RIM is, in my opinion, and likely the securest platform. It's by far the, the, the one that has the most granular configurations to add security at the application level, uh, among other things. It implements encryption, application level security, corporate level security. And when, configured, when you configure it properly, it can be a very secure platform. Um, when the SSA, the et to uh, issue occurred, RIM put out a quote, and it's something that I think I should read exactly here because I think people really need to remember this, but RIM would like to remind our customers that all smartphones can be used as multifaceted application platforms that enable their owners to choose and install a wide range of applications to suit their needs from a large number of third-party developers. But careful consideration should be given when determining which applications are allowed to be installed by the end user on the device. The BlackBerry platform, platform has a number of built-in security measures that require the smartphone user to explicitly agree to install and authorize an application. So at the end of the day, the security of your phone is your problem. And that's, that's really the, the point of that statement. And that includes not just BlackBerry, but across the board, all the, uh, all the marketplace owners and all the mobile platforms. At the end of the day, the security of phone is still your problem. So they're good, they're secure, that's great, that's wonderful, but does that really matter? Interesting stats. <clears throat> Only 23% of smartphone owners use the security software installed on their device. It's a very nebulous stat. What does that mean? Did you install, did you set up the password? Did you, uh, you know, there's a number of different things that that can mean. But let's assume for a moment that that's any kind of security thing on your device. If 20, only 23% are turning on the password to log into the device to, to actually unlock it, how many of those are going through on an application by application basis and securing the stuff they download from the App Store? It's much lower than 23%. 13% of organizations currently protect from mobile viruses at all, which is also a very, very low number. And another interesting stat is that 54% of organizations surveyed plan to deploy mobile antivirus products in 2010. So it's, it's up and coming. This is where the, the malware is headed. This is where the target is going. So let's talk about some of the individual uh, security mechanisms implemented by RIM <coughs> for the BlackBerry de devices. Um, so, there's, so code signing. There's a subset of the BlackBerry API that's considered controlled. Um, for some of the code to be executed and for some of these APIs to be called on the handheld, it has to be signed by the signing key. 
by a RIM signing key. Controlled APIs are split into three categories, runtime APIs, BlackBerry application APIs, and BlackBerry crypto APIs. It's fairly painless to get access, to get your own code signing key. Uh, it's basically as simple as filling out a web form, paying $20, and waiting 48 hours, and boom, I had my keys. Um, I did it in a matter of minutes, received my keys the next business day. I can now sign my code, and it can now execute on any of these controlled or protected APIs. Um, that being said, they used, to allow, um, they used to allow people to use the prepaid calling cards to register these, which will give you full anonymous keys, but that, uh, that had been limited. I tried to do that, and it was stopped, so you might have to steal a credit card once or do something to kind of limit or to kind of bypass it a little bit. So they are trying, they are trying to actively work on this problem. Um, then the next step, the thing you do is you install the keys into, your, into the signature tool. Right, so what they do is they take your credit card to pay the 20 bucks, and then they compare the name that you're registering against the credit card name. So if I get a separate credit card, like a you know, vanilla visa. It has to have your name. The vanilla visa won't have your name in it. You can go online and set the name yourself. Well, okay. Uh, according to my friend here, you can go online and set the name yourself. So if you do that, you'll be able to bypass it. Uh, another thing that I, was gonna, that I was going to do and didn't try is that PayPal actually allows you to set up your own credit card, one-time use credit cards. So if you set up a PayPal account with a fake name, sell something on eBay, get the money into the PayPal account to cover the 20 bucks, and that has your name mapped to that credit card, that would probably work as well, although I haven't confirmed that. Um, so the code signing process itself, um, once you've got the keys installed into the signature tool, applying the appropriate signatures to the code file that's generated is very straightforward. Basically, when you request a signature from RIM, a hash of your code is sent to RIM, and presumably, and, and actually confirmed, I've asked some folks, is stored for later repudiation so that they can, they can see who's signing what code. Uh, but they don't get access to your source code itself, so they don't have any way of knowing what your code does, just that they're going to say, yes, you request, you're using this particular ACI, API set, this particular API set, yes, we're okay with it, and we can actually track it back to the key that signed it. Uh, once the signature process is complete, you can deploy it to a, to a physical handheld. Not a very high barrier to entry, it's uh, trivial to acquire anonymous or otherwise untraceable keys, and I'm sure you can think of a million ways besides the couple that we, we just mentioned. They also have IT policies. Uh, IT policies requires a connection to a BlackBerry Enterprise server. It's, um, it's the highest level of security permission, so to speak, on the device, and is typically pushed from a corporate IT standpoint to the end user device. This policy can restrict a large number of events from happening on the device. It can limit access to third-party apps, allow or deny intranet connections, allow or deny internet connections. Um, these IT policies are generally defined as a default allow, although there are some that are limited, and I'll show you those in a second. And, and in RIM's, RIM's defense, balance really is required here with regards to default deny type positions, because if they go and they block everything as denied or block everything as prompt uh, for every kind of resource access, they're gonna get a backlash from users. Specifically, they're going to get a backlash from the end users. Um, corporate, not so much, but the end users would flip out if they had to get prompted at least once for each, for each access. Yes? Uh, do you have any sense of how common it is for corporations to actually modify the default policies? No, I don't. I did not find any stats that talk about the modification of that. But I know there's, um, I think there's like 400 different default policies in the, in the BEZ server. So pick... They're very difficult to know what does what, so you almost, and there's tons of options within those policies, so it's very difficult to know which ones are the right ones to turn on, and they're generally gonna be a little bit on the lack side because they don't want the backlash from the end user. So, um, then there's application policies, which are similar to IT policies, but they operate uh, one level lower at the handheld itself. They can't, these aren't controlled directly by the BES, but they may be superseded by the BES. So if the BES pushes you can't install third-party apps, you can't change that by using an application policy. But if the BES says you can, you can change it at the, at the individual handheld level, okay? So it can be superseded. Um, the policies can be more narrow and secure, but never, never more lax. Uh, app policies are typically used to enforce resource and connection type activities on a per-application basis. And this is where the end user should be responsible for ensuring that their applications are not accessing resources outside of the expected norm. Again, these are mostly a default allow, allow policy um, across the board. So let's look at those policies in detail. So this is a 4-7 chart I made for policy application permissions, default third-party policy application permissions. Green indicates that 